All right. So uh, a few months back, I, I submitted a PR for, uh, to the script repository in Flatcar. Uh, it was for configuring uh, compression algorithms for the outputted files of uh, a flat car. Now, um, the whole process was uh, very nice, but the, uh, the, the minus in that process was that I, I couldn't see what was happening in the CI at all. So I had to rely on the nice folks from a flat car to shuttle information from the private Jenkins uh, CI into the GitHub pull request whenever something broke and I, need, and I needed to fix it. So soon after that, I started looking into a, a way to uh, create a workflow for uh, the scripts, at least for the scripts uh, repository, to run that those CI steps and for people uh, committing to that particular repo to see the results uh, right inside the, the actual pull request. Now, the first attempt failed very badly, uh, mostly because the default GitHub runners have only two CPU cores. Uh, and Flatcar being a, a, a distribution, a Linux distribution, has many packages you need to compile. And that means it takes a lot of time. Just compiling the, the Flatcar packages without anything else takes roughly five hours. And there's a time limit of about six hours for every job in GitHub to run. So it, GitHub just canceled my job and that was it. Now, to get around this, there are two options. One is to uh, create a GitHub workflow that creates resources on an external cloud somewhere. So create a, a, a VM, a larger VM in any cloud you wish, and use SSH from that job to run the steps inside that uh, particular VM. The other one is to use GitHub self-hosted runners. Now, GitHub gives you the actual binary, the, the actual worker you used to run GitHub jobs. You can set it up yourself on any server you wish. Uh, it'll join GitHub and you can use it. You can reference it using a self-hosted tag or any other tags that you've used. Now this, this runner has two modes of operation. One is uh, uh, the ephemeral version where after each job, GitHub just removes it from the list of runners and the permanent version where you can reuse it over and over again. Now the permanent version, uh, you'll need to clean up yourselves after each job uh, to ensure that you have a clean environment in which you run the tests. Otherwise your tests will be tainted and you can't really trust them. Uh, so the self-hosted version is uh, usually what you would like to use. Uh, this basically ensures that you have a clean environment each and every time to run those tests. Now, managing those self-hosted runners means that after each job, you need to be able to tear them down automatically and spin up another one automatically to replace it. So that when you, the next job runs, you get a, a fresh uh, a fresh worker that's ready to run your tests. So I started uh, fiddling around the APIs and came up with uh, with uh, Garm. Basically, Garm means GitHub Actions Runners Manager. That's that's all it is. So I'm going to show you how it works. Uh, I don't have slides. I don't like slides. Uh, I'm just going to show go go through the thing so you can see it uh, in action. It has native support for LexD, uh, which can run containers and uh, and virtual machines. Now, I must mention, GitHub recommends two open source projects, uh, one of which is uh, an operator on Kubernetes, but that gives you a uh, containers runtime. So for Flatcar, that's pretty difficult to use considering that you guys, your, your SDK is uh, runs on Docker. And the other one is uh, a CDK for uh, AWS essentially. So you're stuck with AWS. Garm was written in a very modular fashion. It has native support for LexD, which allows you to run on any bare metal machine uh, of VM with Linux. And it has also an external provider, which allows you to write your own binary that interfaces with whatever cloud you want. But uh, we wrote a couple of them. One is for, let me make this bigger. Um, one is for OpenStack and one is for Azure. And they're essentially just uh, bash scripts that Garm calls into just to create the necessary resources inside a particular cloud. So let me get to it. To use Garm with your repository or organization, you just have to create a personal access tokens with access to your repo or organization. I already created one and configured it inside the uh, Garm config file. It's a, it's a static config. Um, 
the plan was to use something like vault to store secrets. So for the time being, anything that, that implies secrets is, uh, except for the webhook secret, and I'm gonna show you that in a second, is inside a config file. So credentials list. This is my uh, personal access token, which I'm going to reference when, when I'm going to configure my repository or organization. Now the providers are just an OpenStack external, a local LXD on this machine and an LXD installation on an Ampere ARM server. So I'm gonna show you both, uh, the local one and the remote one. To create a repository, all you have to do is GARM CLI repo add. And the help for this is pretty simple. We just need the credentials which we reference. So in this case, it's Gabriel. The name of the repository, scripts, and the owner, which is uh, my user. And of course, the webhook secret. So the webhook secret is um, used to validate the uh, webhooks that come in from GitHub. So whenever uh, a runner is added or uh, deleted or something happens in the workflow that we need, we care about. A webhook call is sent from GitHub to GARM, telling it that a new job is queued and we need a new runner, or a job is done and we can remove the old runner. So now we added a repo. We need to create a pool for the repo. So we have essentially a few layers uh, of of on uh, in GARM. So we have the repository or organization. We have the pool and we have the runners. You can have multiple pools per uh, repo or organization, and each uh, pool has multiple runners of the same type. So you can mix and match whichever way you want. In this case, we have this particular repo added. Now we need to create a pool for it. So GARM, CLI, pool, add. And here we have a bunch of options. Let's start off with enabled faults for now. The flavor, is the size of the uh, the size of the the runners that will get instantiated. So in LXD, the flavor is the profile. The profile allows you to specify how many disks uh, this particular instance will have, uh, how many NICs, uh, RAM, CPUs, and so on. Uh, I only have one uh, uh, flavor, one profile, which is the default one. We'll use that for now. The image is uh, the usual LXD image that one would use. So Ubuntu, for example, 2004. Um, max runners and uh, min idle runners. So this is the maximum amount of runners that the pool will handle, after which uh, it won't create any more runners. And the, and the min idle runners is essentially a set of warm booted runners that linger and wait for jobs to, to happen. So uh, if you have, for example, an operating system that boots slowly or something that boots slowly, you might want to increase this uh, uh, option and have a bunch of them ready to, uh, to run jobs. Otherwise, you can just leave this to zero and Garm will spawn one up whenever it's needed. Uh, we're just gonna leave those uh, to their defaults for now. The repository, the one we just created. OS architecture. This will be AMD 64. OS type will be Linux. Provider name, this will be local LXD. The one that we showed here, it's LXD local actually. Okay, and tags, this is important. This you'll use to target um, runners that uh, get spun up by this particular pool. So let's go with Ubuntu local LXD, for example, and whatever else with my runner. These are arbitrary. So you can add whatever tags you want. You can use these tags in your workflow to target these partic this, uh, this particular pool of, of runners. So now we have a max runners of five, min idle, idle runners of one for this particular repo, and it's not yet enabled. So if you do a GARM CLI runner, list all there's nothing so let's enable it so garm cli pool update ah sorry about that update uh, this particular pool enabled true 
Now it's enabled, and if we do a Garm CLI runner list, we should still see it. Uh, here we go. And just full screen this. Spending create, now it's creating. And if we look at Alexi list, we see that it's already being spun up. Alexi console, we can see this booting. Our cloud in it is starting up the uh, setup process soon. So these are the default images from LXD. Nothing non-standard. You can build your own if you want with whatever pre-installed stuff you need. But for this demo, it's just a plain vanilla uh, image that comes with LXD. It does the updates. And now it fetches the GitHub self-hosted runner binaries. On archives, let me just show you Garm CLI run list. And we can do a show on this. And we can see the updates happening here as well. Configuring runner. Installing runner service, successfully installed, and it's now idle. So if we switch to our repo, let's try settings, actions, runners, we see it here. So it installed, it spun up, it has our tags. It also has a bunch of default tags, like uh, X, uh, x64 is added automatically self-hosted and Linux is also added automatically. And these are some tags we add that keep track of, uh, of runners created by a particular GARM installation. Now, if we do a GARM CLI uh, pool list, and sorry about that, dash L, pool show, we see that we have this instance here attributed to this particular pool. We can also update the pool to, cre to create more idle runners. Min idle runners, let's say three. And now we see that two more will be created shortly. It's in their impending create. Now they're creating. And we see them being spun up here as well in LXC list. Now, if we want to add a, a, another pool to this, uh, for ARM, for example, we do a GARM CLI provider list. We have this particular um, provider, which is an, uh, an Ampere ARM server. Not exactly sure of the model, but uh, it has a bunch of CPUs that we can leverage. Also with an LXC installation, we can do a pool add, and I'm going to just Enable it by default, true. Flavor default repo, that's okay. So let's do an ARM64 this time, Linux provider name, and peer ARM tags. This is also an Ubuntu and it's running on an Ampere, so, so to speak, and we should be good to go. It's already enabled. So if you do a GARM CLI or slash A, this is in a different pool, which is this one. It's pending create. Now it's creating. And we should see it here as well. It's already running. We're not gonna wait for it to, to, to boot. Uh, eventually it will come up and show up here. Now, if we want to use this, we just have to go to actions. I have a dummy action here we can just run. Uh, we can target the my runner tag, for example. 
it just prints some info, sleeps for one second and exits. Run the workflow. It's been picked up by this particular runner. It finished. So it just does a uname, dash A. Uh, we see that it's on 64-bit, uh, just dumps some file system information, and that's it, essentially. But what's interesting is that when that happened, the old one was deleted, which is, hang on, let me check. which is this one. So this one was deleted and the new one was spun up to replace it. So we still have four, the three from the first pool and the one from the arm, uh, arm pool, this one. This one is new and this one was deleted. Now let's see if... So... So here we go. It's downloading the tools, extracting the runner. This one is the ARM64 one running on NPR. Installing dependencies. These are the dependencies for the runner. Authentication, successfully added. And if we go to our runners, we should see we have also an ARM64 one. We can just run it. And this time with ARM64. This is the, the runner, oops. And here we go. This one was killed, uh, removed. It's no longer there. And we see that a new one is being spun up on the same ARM server. There we go. And that's about it. So essentially, Garm is a simple tool. Uh, it's single purpose. You don't need uh, uh, anything complex to learn. Everything you just saw is everything that it does. There's nothing more complicated than that. All you have to do is define your repositories, your organizations, perhaps, create a pool def uh, with the, the definitions you, you would like to have that pool having inside that pool, the operating system, the size of the machine that you would like to, to, to use, and you're done. Garm takes care of everything automatically. So you don't have to, once you've set up your pools, you can target them, you can create a pool in Azure, you can create a pool in AWS, you can create a pool in OpenStack, uh, LXD on bare metal, or any other cloud provider, you can write a, a, a bash script or a Python script or any, any, any kind of executable you would like. Uh, Garm can use it and can interface with it and can essentially create resources in basically any target cloud. In parallel, you don't have to choose between one or the other. You can give each pool different tags and target them in your workflow. Garm will take care of the rest. Any questions? Yeah, so that looks all very good. Um, thanks a lot for that. Uh, just a, yeah, like a side question. So what do you think? because um, it kind of takes longer to boot up a bare metal instance for a workflow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the compilation of Flatcard takes a lot of resources, but it still looks like it could be done at least to, to a certain amount in parallel on a, on a server that's strong enough. 
So do you think it makes sense to use LXC to? Yeah. So I've tested uh, with I've tested with eight core with sixteen core and it didn't add much to this. So at one point your bottleneck is your download speed, um, and it took one hour and nineteen minutes and fifty nine seconds to 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 build the packages. Uh, it's using the same stuff I found in the Groovy files attached to the GitHub PR that I was involved in. It builds the images. <coughs> Sorry about that. Builds the images and builds the VM images. So this all happens in uh, within one hour and 20 minutes, essentially. Um, using 16 cores didn't add much. I didn't add anything at all, actually. So you can essentially have a bunch of bare metal Equinix machines. So this was run on an Equinix machine, on a VM on an Equinix machine. Um, you can have a bunch of them uh, inside an LXD cluster. You can use LXD clustering. And you can spin up VMs on top of that with as many CPUs you'd like, with as much disk space as you're allowed, and with as much memory you'd like. And it should be good. Setting up LXD is simple, just LXD in it, follow the steps, enable networking, and Garn can connect to it using the same credentials that the CLI does. So you'll need the, the client certificate that gets generated automatically. So for example, in this case, it's in snap LXD common config, not, uh, not this one actually. So snap LXD, Brent maybe? Oh, not here. My apologies, Alex, snap, text D, common, config. So you have the client key, client CRT. Uh, Garn can just use this. And the server certs, which you get once you connect using the CLI. So we have, I have a bunch of remotes, two uh, Ampere ARM servers, the local one, of course, and uh, these are for images. But if you'd like, you can use any cloud. So LXD is just one cloud-like system that you can use. Bare metal directly, I'm not sure it's worth it unless you want to use some specialized hardware that's available only on the actual hardware and which you can't just PCI pass through to the VM. But in most cases, you can just pass it to the VM. So for example, OpenStack allows you to do this <laughs> with virtual GPUs, for example, with uh, uh, Nix, uh, FPGAs. So you can essentially use whatever your cloud allows you to use. Garm just says, I need an instance of this type with the following characteristics, installs the runner on it, and you're good to go. OK, so and that was uh, you want to container or you want to VM with Alex? VM. So Garm just okay. spins up virtual machines for various reasons. One is that you might want to use an SDK like uh, Flatcar has that needs Docker to run. The other one is security. So uh, allowing uh, GitHub workflows to run means that you may potentially be running untrusted code. And a container is uh, sometimes not that hard to break out of. While a VM adds an extra layer, well, not bulletproof, adds an extra layer of security. So you limit uh, any malicious code's ability to run uh, on the host itself. But you still need to take great care not to trigger the workflow unless the code that you're trying to test is trusted. You can do this in GitHub um, by limiting the, um, the automatic running of, of workflows to contributors past contributors or current uh, um, members of the repository and just do it manually or based on a tag um, or some something of the sort. But you have to take great care when running uh, untrusted code inside your CI always, either even if it's GitHub workflows or Jenkins or whatever, because you want to limit the amount of malicious code that may run. So security is important. Containers are nice, but you need to trust the code that you're running inside them. And you, if you look here, it's a virtual machine. I, I really love this. Um, and only just by listening to your presentation, thanks a lot, by the way, this is, this is amazing. Only just by following your presentation, I realized that um, in the new CI automation pipeline, there's a, like a small gap that we didn't consider, which your um, 
your tool exactly fills, and that is how to connect uh, individual workers or runners to uh, GitHub Actions or tags or whatever we use to to um, build and to test um, PRs. That is that is awesome. Thank you for the presentation. My pleasure. Uh, one thing you should know, if you're using an organization, you can actually reuse uh, runners from different repositories. You can trigger uh, actions from other repositories from a particular repository. Um, this works in organizations. Uh, or if you, if you have, for example, uh, two repos of under the same user and you have access rights to both. So you can uh, potentially build the packages, upload artifacts, use those artifacts in a different job running in a different repository. So this is also possible from what I understand. Nice. Yeah, what, that, what GitHub doesn't have, unfortunately, and this is something that most projects uh, usually build on their own or use something that's already built is um, um, unit test aggregation. So once the tests are done, you need something to, to aggregate those results and present them in a fashion that, that are easily digestible by everyone and that allow you to do uh, flaky test detection. Um, so a, a history of test runs and their status, if they succeeded, if they failed. For example, the Kubernetes folks have test grid. Um, let me, so test grid. They have this, uh, let me just, for example, and you see, for example, here we have a test that's flaking a lot, um, but this is something that the Kubernetes folks uh, set up themselves. I'm not sure if this is open source or not. The idea is that you need something like this to, to aggregate the results over a pre period of, times, uh, of time and uh, do flaky test detection and stuff like this. We have the lower level part covered where we can run like any number of tests on um, automatically on, on any number of, uh, of uh, vendor backends. And uh, we rerun tests that are flaky and we also collect the test results and we sum it up to a single like yes or no, depending uh, on if, if any of the tests failed. Uh, we don't have visualization yet, but the tests and the test reports that we deliver are in uh, tab format. So mm -hmm. there should be tooling that, that can, can visualize those results. But it's, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's pretty great to have. No, uh, I mean, uh, this is a minus. Uh, I mean, this is something that's missing by default in GitHub. And it's mostly due to the fact that each project wants different, something different from, from visualizing their test results and keeping track of flake, flaky tests and, and some such. <laughs> so I'm not sure if this is something that's missing in GitHub or if it's something that is, is expected for projects to implement if they want. You may not even need it, so. I think it can be retrofitted pretty easily from the low level bits that you already have. So that's- Yeah. Uh, it is another just, gap, oh, sorry. I just thought it's something that I should mention in regards to GitHub because some people mm. need this and it's, it, you don't have it by default. You need to have your own thing, so. But True. not necessarily, if you don't really need it, that's fine. Cool. Um, any more questions? Thanks again for the presentation, Gabriel. This is my pleasure.